Hi, this is Skill, Mike Skill, and you're listening to Nothing Shocking Podcast. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages-friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Unteed, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Libsyn or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is... Mike Skill of the Romantics. Yeah, uh, promoting his 2021 release, Skill, by Mike Skill. Yeah, he uh, some really great old school rocker tunes, and uh, he, he said he was working on some other tracks maybe this summer that uh, may be in a blues direction. Hey, let's uh, get to that interview. All right, good night. Good night. Mike, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Jeff Unteed. Mike, this is an honor to have you on tonight. Hi, Eric. Hi, Jeff. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for uh, getting contact for contacting me. Absolutely. Thank well, you. Thank you for all the correspondence. And hey, thank you for your willingness to participate. We're excited to have you. Well, we always uh, we always try to keep in touch with uh, the the ground. Uh, let's see, the ground uh, ground zero of rock and roll. <laughs> Very good. So let's get this thing started in. Uh, 2021, in the midst of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, you released your solo album, Skill. Can you talk a little bit more about the uh, creation of this new, uh, solo endeavor? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I had a few tracks already recorded. I, I, uh, my son's school, he had, the school he was at, um, had two uh, double-wide trailers. One was a math class and one was a music, uh, music and art class. Mm -hmm. And the one at the music and art class, I brought in all my equipment. It had a small area, and the kids would use my guitars and all that kind of thing, and uh, drums. they play the drums in the day. And at night, I would go in there and I'd, I'd re re record basic tracks. Mm -hmm. So I accumulated uh, six to ten uh, basic ideas, and some of them more than others. Um, and um, finished them up. Uh, well, picked out the best ones that I thought were uh, closer to finished, and uh, um, got together. Uh, went to Chicago uh, with, with Brad Elvis uh, from the Elvis Brothers, yes. who plays drums for the Romantic, Romantics, um, and our friend Mike Hagler over there. He has a, a studio there, and um, he, I can't, went in and he checked them out, and uh, we did some more work on them, and uh, we we did some mixes on them. And I held on to him, um, came home on the road with Romantics and stuff. And then I was in Detroit, and um, my friend Chuck Chuck Ocasian, he asked me what I what I what I had, what I what what stuff do I had? He he, he had heard that I had some stuff, some uh, good tracks gone down. And I, I sent about eight, I think about eight tracks to him. He mix, he started mixing them. He started pulling them all together because mm. some of the stuff was. Um, uh, on a grid, some of it was, some of the drums were not a grid. You had to go through it, 
organizers that they, that the people that I worked with didn't do. And because uh, I would then have someone come in, uh, another guitar player, musician, or friend uh, would come in the studio, my little studio carver at Carver School, my son's school, and they would just turn on the recorder, and, and I'd have a drummer. I wouldn't be a real drummer. Not. Well, it's a mixture. It's a mixture of a sound man playing drums on 67 Riot. I just told him to play kick and snare. Don't do anything fancy. Just play it straight. <laughs> and uh, he played drums a bit. And so um, we had just like this um, kind of a menagerie of a backtracks that became the songs. And then I got them to Chuck and Chuck took, took them to the next level. And they just like, they like sprung. They like sprung, bounced right off the speaker. They were just like yeah. really sound really great so um that all worked out really well and um and um yeah and i started releasing them oh the pandemic ha pandemic happened and i had these tracks and um so uh chuck goes you got these tracks you might as well finish up a couple more so we finished a couple more and i had a whole album so i started releasing it and uh during the pandemic released uh, i think six or seven or eight songs um over uh the one year about a year and a half ago, two years, almost two years ago, or two years ago, and so we started out with um, my business, or um, which was written by Brad Elvis and his wife. They were on the way back from a Detroit show, a Romantics Detroit show, uh, a Romantics show at uh, Motor City, um, Michigan, Michigan International Speedway. We played oh, with, cool. um, I think it was with Brand Fun, big uh, festival thing, in Chicago, and uh, they drove back. And um, they started writing lyrics to Carrie Got Married. And it was like an answer to um, the romantic song is Tell It to Carrie. Yeah, I was going to ask so you. They got, all, they got the muse, they got the muse, they got the words to two verses, I think. They had some music in their mind. And then uh, when I was recording my stuff and I went to Chicago with, with, with uh, Mike Hagler, we threw this up and uh, uh, on, ta on tape and I finished it up and added all my guitar, my kind of like um, trademark guitar stuff. My, my stuff that sounds, you know, kind of like Pete Townsend meets George Harrison meets me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. It's just my my um, ringing guitar sound sound that I have. And uh, it really made the song uh, really well. And that's the first song we, re we released. Then we released Not My Business, which is, uh, I wrote that, uh, all the lyrics, all the words. All these are all mine. Uh, my Bad Pretty, another one, and 67 Riot. Uh, we got your rock and roll soul soul alone and uh, I just later on I did a re I recut uh, what I like about you yeah um, yeah it turned out really good I was surprised and um, you know I played it for so long and uh, my uh, my flex inflections of my voice is the same as the original because we grew up in the same neighborhood uh, it sounds kind of like it and uh, and on 67 right we really sat but then later um, not too much later, uh, a few months or so, I think maybe in the middle su middle of summer, we, I called Wayne Kramer up. I, I love the guitar player uh, Wayne Kramer and Fred Smith of the MC5. And um, I told, I was in a studio with Chuck, and I go, Chuck, you know, Wayne Kramer would sound really good on this song. And he goes, well, call him up. I, go, I don't know. I go, he goes, just call him. I go, I can't call him. I grew up listening to him. Taking the MC5 records on the L on the record player, slowing them down to 16 revolutions per minute, and learning all the guitar solos. <laughs> I go, he's like they're like my idols. I go, I can't call him. He goes, you got to call him. So I go, give me, let me think about it. So I thought about it for about five minutes, and I go, okay, I'll call him. I call him up, and um, he goes, Mike, how you doing? I go, yeah, send me the tracks. You can send the, send the tracks over. I go to, uh, for for the song 67 Riot. Right? It's got the vibe of MC5 and 1967 and all that. And uh, he got it. He called me back. And uh, I checked back with him. I forget if I called him or he called me. Um, he said, Mike, I love the song. I got his own fan of it. So I said, just do whatever you used to do and do what you do now and just play it. And, uh, we'll go with it. And so um, I get it back and it was like, oh, my God. It's like it's just like going back uh, – to the MC5, I go. This is, this is so, good. Chuck. We can't touch. Don't turn it down. Don't cut it. Put it on. Leave it the way it is, and we'll go with it. So that's what we did. We released it just the way it was. He said it. We didn't even cut it up or turn it down or anything. It was just, just genius for what I wanted. Wanted on that song, and we put that out. And we also, I go. 
I told my wife, I go, let's uh, let's do a single, a vinyl single, 45, and we'll put 67 Riot, and mm-hmm. on the back, uh, what did I put on the back? Uh, I think I put Not My Business, uh, My Bad Pretty, I think it's on oh, the back. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. cool song. And, uh, and uh, the garage, kind of a garage basher. Yeah. And, uh, and what I told him, I go, let's get um, the label on the 45, we'll get would get the label of like the MT5 had on their 45 when they did looking at you, their first 45. Mm-hmm. We'll get the lettering that uh, kind of Grandy Ballroom, uh, 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 you know, that poster art, that poster art style yeah. yes. from Gary Grimshaw. From Gary Grimshaw used to do all the posters. The ballroom in San Francisco, the famous ballroom. Uh, I called the artist's wife and he passed away. Um, and uh, Gary Grimshaw's wife and uh, – he had passed away, and she goes, "Yeah, you, 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 it'd be all right. Great, go ahead, use it." And I got this. She had an artist friend uh, make draw the lettering up so my name fit in, and the, the same name, yeah. Mike Skio looked like the MC5 lettering all that. And then with the cover, I copied. We, uh, my son's a photographer, so I had him look at the original 45, and I took a photo of me and me and Wayne, and we did a black and white, both uh, after the first MC5 record. I don't tell a lot of people that, but they find out on their own. But um, <laughs> yeah. so it came out, and yeah, well, it's it looks like cool. uh, yeah, because I remember when that uh, looking at you came out. I had a like a high school band. We were like seven, sixteen, or seventeen years old, fifteen or sixteen years old, and uh, it was getting passed around that that forty five, that C five. Looking at you, it sounded like it's in a basement. The fuzz tone on the guitar and reverb, and it's just like so manic and so like. Uh, it's so raw. It's so raw. It's like if you took the if you took the Who, Yardbirds, and Van Morrison, Van Morrison kind of the way that that vibe. If you took that, it was just like that. It was just like my song. My song came out like that modern, and their song "Looking at You" was just so raw. Um, we loved we loved it. It's good, yeah. So okay. that's how that song right. came about. Yeah. Well, I, I saw on the album you played both guitar, bass, and of course you talked about doing vocals. Can you talk a little bit more about doing uh, multi instruments on, on your own album? Well, um, yeah. Um, all through, uh, like I was mentioning, my my first band, the High Tide. I played guitar. I learned guitar. I was learning all the uh, Rolling Stones, uh, the early albums, uh, the first five or six albums they put out. All those records, and yeah. uh, right around around the time of Flowers and all that, um, and before, and I uh, learned that basic raw guitar feel, and uh, the 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 Van Morrison that them record is what I was talking about that kind of raw sound. I would listen to um, the guys that did uh, Gloria, um, Shadows of Night, mm. and um, and so that the Kinks, the Kinks and the Animals came out. And that was really instrumental yes. in the raw edge of my thing and the Detroit hearing that five, MC5 record. So um, that had a lot to do with uh, um, with how it, where I come from guitar-wise. And uh, I realized, oh, there's a bass player. So I started playing bass <laughs> on a guitar and then finally got a bass guitar and learned. Uh, and my friends would come over. Uh, I think uh, Sergeant Pepper had just come out, the record, the album. And uh, I finally got that for the next Christmas. Next Christmas, I got it. So that the summer after it came out, and it came out in like February or something of '67. So I, in like '68, the summer of '68, I was 14 or 15, or whatever it was, and uh, I started. Uh, I learned all the bass parts on uh, on uh, Sergeant Pepper. So. Um, and then I was learning all the stuff on uh, all every song of the songs that came out at the time. Motown. I grew up in growing up in Detroit. Um, uh, listening to early Motown when I was ten years old. I'm hearing uh, Smokey Robinson uh, sing "Shop Around." The th- the thing about where I come from musically, people don't realize is I go my my history for it, my ear for it goes way back. My brothers were 14, 13, and fourteen years old in the fifties. So their records, I was playing their records. Me and my little brother were five and six years old. We're playing their records yeah. on on a little Disney rock and roll, little Disney, uh, uh, what do you call it? You know, Mickey Mouse. Uh, Turntable, yeah. We listen to it, we get in trouble. We're playing their records. Mm-hmm. But we're just listening to a Little Richard, Rip It Up. Yeah. We're listening to uh, 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 Jerry Lee Lewis. Um, um, a lot of the black doo-wop groups, a lot of the the... the 
those groups and and uh, Elvis to Heartbreak Hotel. And um, so we're listening, I'm listening to all that stuff, five, six years old and seven years old, I grew up. And then next thing I'm, I'm hearing uh, Buddy Holly, I'm dancing, on, I'm a kid, little kid dancing on the back, the bumper, you know, the bumper, it's about the transmission on the seat back in those days, <laughs> the back seat, I'm a little kid bouncing to uh, Everly Brothers, singing to Everly Brothers. And uh, then next thing you get is, uh, next thing you get, uh, when I was in junior high school, then would have been like, uh, the Kinks or uh, Louie Louie from Kingsman. And uh, of course, I'm living in Portland, Oregon now, and, and Kingsman were from this area. So, But um, the Kinks and the Kingsman were like one of the things that set me off on really the, the hard edge guitar, along with all the other stuff that came around. Then the next thing you know, um, Motown in Detroit, and then the MC5, and all those groups were playing all the teen clubs in Detroit. So my musical tastes come, come right from the 50s all the way through, all the way up to you know now still you know still listening to new stuff and all that yeah. so that's how I, and I got the bass just because it was a necessary ego yeah. and I played it all through high school and uh, I met Jimmy the drummer for the romantics in high school and we uh, went from the my little high my little high school band to his his neighborhood and we had a little band we never played anywhere and then we started playing all the in the in, then I went, uh, we formed a uh, more grown ups you know, 18 year old band together. We're 18 years old. We're more grown up. We're learning, uh, you know, Fleetwood Mac and Humble Pie and early Led, the first few Led Zeppelin art records and uh, Mata Hoople and uh, T Rex, all that stuff. That was our that was our groove. Jake with, with um, Mick Ranson and all that. So learning uh, bass from like the Who and uh, you know my favorites were John Entwistle at the time and Jack Bruce and and Paul McCartney and Chris Squire. From the S, were the, the bass players and John uh, and Jane, John Paul Jones, and then you had all the AM, you know, the Motown music, and the Motown and James Brown that I learned bass from, and so I was really uh, drum oriented because I almost played drums. I, I joined the Boy Scouts in like, oh my God, sixth grade, seventh, yeah. sixth yeah. grade, I guess, I joined, just to get just to get in the marching band to have a snare drum. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I brought it home and I and I quit the. Boys comes in. I kept the snare drum. They, they were calling me up, and I gave it back. But <laughs> um, so I, I learned how to keep a beat. So I was still playing guitar. My guitar playing is really percussive, and Pete Townsend's is really percussive. So I learned from all that. Well, very, um, very the style. Good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. And that that kind of leads to the next question about the yeah. uh, creation of the Skill album. Was um, <clears throat> did you find that the uh, pandemic gave you inspiration for your musical creativity to create a new solo album or was it just business as usual for yeah. yourself no it wasn't business as usual. we're off the road and we're, we're you know uh, not going for anywhere you know like now still it's it's really uh few and far between we're pick and choose gigs and shows and stuff you know make sure you get the right stuff and safe and everything and tours and um i'm at home and then i had my this stuff already in the can kind of and Chuck had done it, and then I'm I finished it, and I'm going. Well, the only next thing to do is finish it up and put it out. So we started releasing it all digitally because uh, all the pressing plants were shut down, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, plus extra money from not playing shows for two years. I uh, couldn't throw extra money into just recording a record yet, and uh, and then when it opened up a little bit, uh, all the major labels were were co-opting all the pressing plants so you couldn't do anything so now now uh, you can get in so now now's the time for me to get in to get uh, the album on vinyl so that's the next thing but um, oh yeah um re you know doing some research on the romantics i didn't realize you guys had some new songs out in like 2016 you guys did some covers of uh daydream believer uh we gotta yeah gotta get out of this place by the animals um i fought the law and Hush. yeah uh, can you talk a little we, bit more yeah, about making making some music around that time? Yeah, it was it wasn't very normal for us to do uh, a lot of covers of that, and especially a monkey song. But I figured I could um, attack it like um, thinking of the Yardbirds. I didn't make it as dirty, but I, I was thinking in terms of Dave Reaver Believer. I was thinking in terms of um, kind of like Yardbirds Jeff Beck when he does uh, they do um, uh, high hole so uh, I think high hole silver lining. Uh, it's a more pop 
pop version of a, 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 it's kind of a pop English version of a Ginger Believer in the guitar part. So anyway, this lady, uh, this woman, beautiful person from uh, Canada, Toronto, Toronto, Canada, called us up and wanted us. Uh, she was head of um, music at um, KTEL. KTEL, and she goes, look, I, I want you to, um, uh, you guys use some songs for me. I, I got a, li a list of songs. We picked out all these songs, and uh, we ended up recording them our, our way for, to our sound. I had all the guitar parts and some of the bass parts and a lot of bass parts. She was going to put it out and release it, and I finished it all up. I finished a lot of guitar stuff, and then uh, uh, there were some questions whether someone else wanted to release it or not, and it kind of went back and forth, and I was pushing to release it, and someone else didn't want to release it. It just kind of went by the wayside, and she still has it. And so I guess some of them have seeped out into the Internet mm -hmm. now. So And there's some good stuff. I oh, mean, yeah. It's really good. Yeah, it's, I mean... Hey, do you believe, believe her? I would I would go back in and um, dirty up the guitar a little bit, make it a little more, uh, throw a fuzz tone on it or, or distortion on it, and it would come off like totally like a yardbird stuff. <laughs> it would come out. It, most of most of most of the stuff I would go back and like re-engineer it just to make it a little hotter, a little hotter, raw, a little raw, like like my record. Uh, yeah, and so it was a great opportunity, and uh, I think they're still there. Um, I even do, I think live in set occasion, you know, we do I Fought the Law. I think a lot of people do I Fought the Law, but they leave a lot of that guitar. When I was a kid, I loved that song. The guitar part was incredible. It's, it's like a Buddy Holly song. I did all the guitar parts and, and really up my stuff. Like it was a guy that got out of jail with a guitar. <laughs> it was a guy. Yeah. It was a guy. The band, yeah, they came out of jail. Yeah, I do it occasionally live. I Fought the Law. and, and uh, But um, yeah. Thanks for asking about that. Oh, absolutely. It was a good experience. I, I do. I wanted to bring this back to um, your uh, <clears throat> remake of "What I Like About You" on the your, your solo oh, yeah. your, your solo album. I guess you know what was the uh, motivation to to redo it. I mean, it, it, the song is um, an automatic we, classic. You know. Yeah, we were at a point where I was doing uh, my record, and I, then I decided I was going. I wanted to do "What I Like About You." So uh, I got drum, a drum track from Brad, and um, I had done a raw guitar track on it in Chicago, and I had to, I had to, uh, the download. I uh, brought it to my studio in Portland. Now I, at, by this time I had a brand new studio, a new place for a studio. I brought my son in. My son, uh, he, uh, he went to uh, he, he know he knows recording anyway. He knows how to use the board and everything. So uh, I brought him in, and um, I pulled out um, a high watt, just like I used uh, on the original. I pulled out a, a Rick, my Rickenbacker, just like the original that I did on the original record. Uh, the high watt amp that I had had the markings still on it from the studio from the 80s. Mm -hmm. I set the marks to the uh, original settings, came back, and started doing the vocal. Now the vocal we went through, and... Uh, just um, I sang it uh, two or four times, and we we kept uh, the best parts, and he he mixed it and put it together, uh, and then we sent it off to Chuck, and Chuck uh, 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 went over that mix and uh, did a final mix, and uh, he sent it back. I go less bass, uh, more room sound on the guitar a little bit, and um, make it hot, <laughs> and but but we can we can make it hot off the for the. Uh, for the pressing, and retain still the, the the clean guitar edge edge to it. He knew exactly what I was talking about, and he sent it back. And I'm going. I, I wanted to just cry. It was just like beautiful. It was just the way. Just uh, it caught the energy. But it's got like a modern. Uh, it's almost like a modern garage, garagey thing, yes. and um, it fits right into now. Um, but it's still got that uh, throwback feel. Yeah. That edge, yeah, it's still got that original from the original single. It turned out really good. I'm really happy with it. Fantastic, it really good. Yeah. fantastic. Well, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed your new album. Did, did it give you kind of a? Did it give you kind of that vibe to maybe come up with a follow up? Yeah, well, um, I'm still pushing out a couple more. I'll push out a couple more songs. Um, I might push out. Ah. Uh, uh, I want to do Calling. Calling's really turned out to be a really good song. Mm -hmm. uh, that and what I like about you, I might put out again. 
um, and another I'll pick another song off the record. And then I've, I'm already writing. I have, I probably have half to a full record of music already. Nice. Um, yeah, some of it I'm off. It's coming like a mashup garage, like like the other record, but it's coming out like a little blue, like a bluesier. Yeah. A little bit more. Yeah, it's got like a, a garagey bluesy. Uh, so it's still the same. It's still it's still the same groove. I mean, I'm not changing up my the way I check the guitar or anything. It's just, it's just got some. Uh, it's kind of a, shu- uh, a blues shuffle to it, it's, but it's, it's it's like I got a early zap kind of thing to it. So, but it's cool. Yeah, nice. So it, it's uh, yeah, it's all it's all guitar-y and that, and um, yeah, it's just it'll be hot. I, I got some real good new songs coming up. I'm always I'm always searching in my mind's always going into uh I've got one that's uh it's kind of reminds me of Beatles during Bulldog era. I don't know if it'll come off that way. It reminds you of that lyrically and melodically. But you know, you get in the studio and play it and it comes it comes out the way it comes out. Anyway, so I got uh, I've got a good uh eight good ones and a bunch of a hand, couple handfuls of other ones to choose from. Oh, fantastic. So, fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. one last question for you. What, what's up next for you as far as uh, the summer and the live show circuit goes for you? What, 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 yeah, are, you, what are you doing? Are you doing? Uh, well, I, I had this uh, Johnny Thunders uh, memorial, and um, uh, he, had, he had the Heartbreakers, and it was Johnny Thunders and, and Wally, um, uh, Wally Walter Lure. Walter Lure was in the band, and both of them passed away. Of course, you probably know that Walter Lure was he gets it last. He played Les Paul. He was the original Heartbreakers. Um, before John, before uh, before um, Tom Petty had Heartbreakers, and Johnny Thunders had Heartbreakers, and uh, it was New York band. And we saw him in New York, and uh, I knew Johnny a little bit. You see him when he come to talking. Uh, he go, "Hey, Skill, hey, Skill!" He just yell across the room, and. Uh, uh, at parties, we go to parties after after shows and stuff. But uh, uh, I go into New York and do a memorial and play uh, five, five, six, eight songs, and um, it's at the the CBG, uh, not CBG, it's the new CBG. It's called uh, the Bowery Electric, I think it's called. Yes. Bowery Electric, and I went there uh, last year, and I was just supposed to go coming up, but I'm, I'm going to hold off and go later in the year, I think. Uh, They'll have another one. They do one for Walter, and then they do one for Johnny. And it's really cool. It's, it's a really cool club. And it's a small little good vibe place. And uh, but I, I'm going to pass on that. I had that. But I've got this other thing here in Portland, Oregon. I'm doing an art festival here, yeah. art fair. And then I go back to Detroit. I do that in about a week. Then I go back to Detroit. And I'm doing a thing for, you know, the artist Rodriguez? Yes. The guy out of Detroit? Mm-hmm. He's, uh, he, he came out of Detroit he did a he did a record. It was kind of like a uh, he's a Spanish cat, Mexican cat, and uh, he came out of Detroit. And uh, he used to be uh, he was signed to Motown in like the late '60s. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing about it: he, he rediscovered. He's living in Detroit. He was redoing. He was out of work. Uh, uh, he started fixing up houses, uh, redoing houses. He did his whole block, his whole neighborhood. He ended up redoing all the houses on his block in the inner city of Detroit. And then he gets this call that his record was like platinum or something in in Africa and yes. in somewhere Africa nations and um, and uh, Australia and uh, what you call it, the other um, the other the island next to Australia. I can't New Zealand right now. In New Zealand. Yeah, New Zealand. And then he, these records going going gold and platinum. So he went on the road on the tour. Anyway. Well, come to find out, I'm thinking back, and I'm going. I live on the east side of Detroit, uh, far side by the river, down way down that east side. It's it's right. The next three blocks are uh, as far as you can go on the east side of Detroit, and then you hit Gross Point, which is like if you've seen movies about yeah. Gross Point, it's kind of uppity, uppity, ritzy kind of. All the people moving moving there in the 1920s and 30s. So there's some mansions out that way, and it's many mansions and. It was just a uh, small neighborhood, but I lived over there. And when we were playing baseball in the summer or at school, there's this guy walking around the neighborhood, and he's got a guitar on his back, and he's got his black hair slick back, and he's probably 16 or 17, and he wears all black. It's the summer, and he's got this guitar. And then you see him walking, and then we're playing in my neighborhood after school, 
And then one time, I remember this guy walking by, and we stopped and talked to him. He said, yeah, I don't remember that he called himself Rodriguez, but we're in for Motown, and I'm, I've got these songs. He played a song. When we're like 10 years old, we don't even know. <laughs> you know, and it turned out it's Rodriguez. He's on the, from the east side of Detroit. He's just rolling around on the streets looking for work and stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. crazy. So I'm doing this show. I can't wait to meet, talk to him. I'm uh, doing the show in Detroit with um, uh, with Vinny from Sponge. Mm-hmm. Vinny from Sponge playing yeah. there. Derek St. Holmes. Derek St. Holmes from uh, uh, Ted Nugent. Yeah, yeah. Before. Let's see. And we have Marty from uh, Cactus. He's from Cactus and Rockets. And a bunch of guitar players and bands from up to Treasure Planet. That'd be really good. It's for uh, Rodriguez's birthday celebration. Oh, making a birthday. Yeah, that so, sounds fun. Then I come back to Port- Portland, and I'm playing Portland and doing a number of other things it's coming up. So, yeah. Yeah. You got a, bu- and, uh, you and got a then, busy schedule. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. And then um, I'll get in the studio and do some, throw some uh, backtracks down and get with Brad. I'll Brad come in or something and. Brad does drums a lot of times. I had the the drummer on um, on this skill Mike Skill record, uh, Kevin Rankin. He's now in uh, Fox Seagulls, so he did. He played on a song called uh, Center Song, and another song I have. But um, yeah, I so he pretty. he'll come in. He'll give him another record too. I'll come in again. So yeah, yeah, my my band pretty. You're right, exactly. Very good. And. Uh, yeah, man, I, I really appreciate you calling and uh, or, or wanting me to uh, contact me to do this. Yeah, absolutely. So, music's still out there. The album's available on uh, MuchGo.com and Bandcamp. And, you know, all the digital shit, all, uh, all the streaming sites, uh, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, Bandcamp, SoundCloud, all those got music out on there. Oh, fantastic. The new record. Well, yeah. uh, this is how things are going to work out. We're about three weeks behind on our episodes, but once Jeff gets it all edited and gets it cleaned up here, we'll send you the link. Please okay. sh- please share it wherever you can. All right. All right, Mike, thank all you right, so well, much. Take it easy, man. Take, take care. care. Yeah. Oh, thanks, thank man. you. Take care. I really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Everybody pulls the plug and says their last goodbyes. Move to the sunshine, fight the grip of nights. If they ever take from you, then you plug out.